There have been times of enormous volcanic eruptions, big asteroid impacts, so all kinds of things have happened to the Earth over time. But we had ancestors that survived all of these apocalypses. The first primates started to live and started to evolve and started to change and spread around the world because the dinosaurs died. Thank God the dinosaurs didn't survive. Exactly. We would not be here. Who are you? All right. Well, hi, I'm Steve. I'm a paleontologist. I study dinosaurs and other types of fossils, and I write about them, and I speak about them, and I'm just generally very enthused about the history of life. Uh, okay. So today we're going to see the whole history of the world through paleontology. First of all, can you explain me what's the difference between paleontology and archaeology? <clears throat> paleontology, which is what I do, that that's the study of ancient life generally, uh, whether it be dinosaurs or woolly mammoths or trilobites or, or plants, whatever, any type of life that's lived over the more than four billion years probably of evolution on Earth. Archaeology specifically is about humans, and it's about more recent humans and human culture and human cultural artifacts. So that's the difference. Paleontologists and archaeologists, we both like to dig up stuff. That's a big part of our job. We're out there with our hammers and shovels, digging in the rocks, digging in the dirt, looking for either fossils in the case of paleontologists or artifacts and clues from human history in the case of archaeologists. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, so can you explain me a bit more details? Like, okay, you go and dig things and you see fossils and then what, like you go and study them in the lab, like how, how does that ha happen? And it's like, we have machines that immediately tells you, oh, this is 5 billion years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, my, a big part of my job is going out, looking for fossils and then studying those fossils. And a fossil is any record of ancient life. It can be a skeleton of something. It could be a bone. It could be a tooth. It could be a feather. It could be a leaf from a plant. Or it could be something like a footprint or a handprint, something that a, uh, an animal once left behind. But a fossil is any sign of ancient life, and fossils are preserved inside of rocks. And basically, if you see a dinosaur skeleton in a museum, those are bones that were once proper living bones, like the bones in our body, the dinosaur then died, those bones were buried by sand or by mud, and they hardened into rock, and that rock encased the fossil inside. So paleontologists like me, we go out and we look for rocks because rocks are the things that hold the fossils. And, and so when, you see, of, yeah. when you see a rock, you can understand that this has... Uh, from the outside, like, do you have a machine to understand that the, uh, how does that happen? There's not Sorry for normally, cutting you up. Uh, no, did you, no, no, uh, no. Uh, did you want to say something? Uh, no, uh, no, I, I was just going to continue. Add? In fact, based on, you know, exactly going down the lines of what you were saying. So a big part of being a paleontologist is understanding rocks. We go out and we look for rocks and we want to look for the right types of rocks. Because if you want to find a dinosaur, you can't just start digging in your backyard or you can't just go out to the closest place where there might be some rocks and start cracking those rocks open. You have to go to places that have the right types of rocks. And so if you want to find a dinosaur, you need to go to places where there are rocks that formed during the time dinosaurs lived, which was between about 230 and about 66 million years ago. Uh, and you also want to look in rocks that are the right type so rocks that were formed in the places dinosaurs lived. So rocks like, say, sandstones, which are made up of hardened sand grains from beaches or from rivers. Those are the kind of places dinosaurs lived in. Rocks from the middle of a volcano? No, you wouldn't want those because dinosaurs didn't hang out in, the, in lava pools. And so a big part of our job is studying rocks, learning about rocks, learning how to identify rocks, and using uh, what we see in the rocks 
but also maps of the world to tell which types of rocks are where. And so thankfully, a lot of the world, the rocks of the world have been mapped because people want to know where you find coal, where you find oil, where you find diamonds. So a big part of the work of geologists, the scientists who study rocks, is going out around the world, figuring out which rocks are where. So we consult those maps. We also learn a lot about rocks ourselves. And so uh, we can identify those types of rocks that maybe, just maybe, might have dinosaurs. And then we have to go and look at those rocks. And there's no fancy tool. There's no radar. There's no sonar that we shoot into the rocks. Not at all. Looking for dinosaurs or looking for other fossils is a lot like looking for gold. You go out, you know you're kind of in the right area. You know there could be gold out there, but you got to put in the work. You got to look, you got to search. And that means looking at a lot of rocks, looking for anything sticking out of the rocks that looks like it could be a bone or could be a tooth, something that has the right shape, something that's the right size, something that has maybe a special color, a special texture. And you get more and more experienced as a dinosaur hunter, a fossil hunter to recognize those things. So very much we use the same methods as fossil hunters did hundreds of years ago. And uh, you spoke that there is only in specific areas. Uh, what define those areas? Mm -hmm. So I tell a, a lot of stories of real life experiences of going out looking for fossils in some of the, the books that I've written. So I, I search for fossils, I study fossils, but I also love to write about fossils and communicate about fossils. And I've written a couple pop science books over the last few years. And one's called The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. It's all about the history of dinosaurs and stories about how we discover dinosaurs. And then I have a newer one called The Rise and Reign of the Mammals, which takes the story forward from the dinosaurs till today, our story. What Hour. Which will have the books in the link in the description, by the way. That's to check awesome. Them out, guys. And so, you know, of course, we always love to plug our books when we do these conversations. But, <laughs> but in the answer to your question, I tell a lot of stories in these books of actual times that I've gone out with my colleagues, with my students, with, with my friends to look for fossils and stories also of other people that have gone out to look for fossils and what that process is, how you get started, how you start to think about discovering fossils. And for most of us, we are interested in some specific question, some specific mystery. And let's say I'm interested in the origin of dinosaurs. I want to know where dinosaurs came from, how these amazing animals first evolved, what their world was like. Well, I would want to try to look for fossils in rocks that come from the Triassic period of time. That's the period from about 250 million years ago until about 200 million years ago. That's the time that we know dinosaurs got their start. And I would probably want to look for rocks of that age that were formed in rivers or in lakes or on the beaches, the kind of places dinosaurs would live. So I would start looking at maps of rocks around the world and look for Triassic age rocks and ones that were sandstones or mudstones formed in those areas. And then if I found some places that looked promising, I'd probably dive deep into research on the internet using the scientific literature to see maybe if somebody, some geologist, some hiker had ever found a little piece of bone in those areas. And that's how we start to narrow it down to where fossils could be found. Okay, so you go online and you write, oh, where is those rocks that are 250 million years <laughs> old? And then you see if there is, is there is a Google something for a paleontologist that you can find, oh, this person found this here, or this was found here, and this was found here. And then you made kind of an educated decision, you narrow the area from the whole planet to something smaller, and then you exactly. go there in the, wow. So your job yeah. involves a lot of nature. A lot of nature, we do a lot of a homework, we have to read a lot, we have to think a lot, we have to take inspiration and, and information from other fields like geology or like travel. Uh, and uh, we have to apply that. And then we go out and we look for fossils and we literally just walk around looking to see what's in the rocks. But then if we find something, Maybe we see something in the rocks that's sticking out. It kind of looks like a bone. It has a different color than the rest of the rock. It has a different texture. We Then we take out our tools. Then we start to dig around that bone. Then we might take out our hammers and chisels to remove some of the harder rock. And we'll see if there's more of that 
sticking into the rock. Maybe that bone leads to another bone. Maybe it leads to a skeleton. So at that point, we start digging up the fossil. If it really is a fossil, we'll keep going. Uh, and then we will protect it as best we can and we'll bring it back to the lab. And that's where the tools and the technology and all the fun and all the modern science comes into play. Because now we can put our fossils into a CAT scanner to use the x-rays to see inside. That's how we know, for instance, what the brains of dinosaurs looked like. We can use computer modeling. We can use some of the same software movie animators use to make digital models of dinosaurs to see how they moved, how they walked, how heavy they were. We can use AI. People are using a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning to study big data sets of the measurements of dinosaur bones to see how dinosaurs changed and evolved over time. So paleontology is a really fun science because it combines that old fashioned gold prospector mentality of going out and discovering stuff out in the desert or wherever you may want to go with that new age, new high duty, high tech science of the 21st century. So for me, it's that combination of the old and new. It's the combination of discovery and technology that makes paleontology so much fun. But it's so surprising for someone that doesn't know anything about paleontology that you go and do everything manually until you find the, the thing. That there is no tools to identify and help you on that. So that's uh, true. And look, people have tried, right? I mean, it would make our jobs a lot easier if you had some radar gun that you could just take with you and just shoot it into the rocks and see, ooh, there's a dinosaur skeleton five feet below the surface. Okay, dig there. Uh, in Jurassic Park, the first film, there's a scene of the paleontologist digging up a dinosaur using this sort of theoretical fancy tool. People have tried and it just doesn't work very well because those dinosaur bones are basically rocks. The bones have turned into rocks. They're inside of other rocks. It's really hard to get that contrast. Uh, you know, if you think of if, if sonar or radar or an x-ray, something like that, it's just really hard because you have rocks inside of rocks. It doesn't work. I wish it did. Maybe in the future, somebody will find a new and better technology for doing that, for making our lives a lot easier. But until then, we have to go out, walk around, look at the rocks. But that means we get to go to lots of cool places. We get to go out on an adventure looking for treasure, essentially. And I think there's very few jobs, very few callings in the world that allow you to do that. And that makes paleontology a detective game, which is a whole lot of fun. We are going to touch a bit more into AI later and your thoughts about how this will change your, your job. But, uh, let's first dive into the promise that we gave in the beginning. We're going to see history through paleontology. Can you give me like, uh, so basically all the stuff that we know about history is because of paleontology, the long history of the world. What we know about the history of the Earth, and especially the history of life on Earth, comes down to what we learn from paleontology. It's the fossils that we find that tell that story. And really, paleontologists are like detectives. We're, we're a lot like a police detective. If, if a crime has been committed, the detective goes out and looks for clues to try to figure out what happened. That crime's already happened. It's in the past. But they have to figure out what it was. I mean, they look for fingerprints or hair or whatever the case may be. For paleontologists, all this history of life has happened. It's already happened, but we want to figure out what happened. So we go out and we look for the bones and the teeth and the skeletons and the footprints. And we put those clues together to tell us the story of life. And that tells us, first of all, that the Earth is about four and a half billion years old, which is just a remarkably huge number that I think humans can't really comprehend just how big of a number that is. But it wasn't that long after the Earth uh, formed. Uh, maybe you, because you are a bit older than me, maybe you can comprehend better. <laughs> maybe. Uh, that, that, that's a joke. <laughs> I would not. I would. You know what? I might be older than you. I might have had all this training in paleontology and geology, all these academic degrees and so on. That gives me no benefit in terms of understanding this compared to you or compared to anybody who's listening. Every, even every scientist, we what we don't really understand. We can't really internalize what it means, you know, a billion years 
a million years even. These are such huge numbers. The point is that the Earth is so old and the Earth is so much more than what we see today. And the Earth has been through a lot over its history. And there have been ice ages. There's been, there have been many times of global warming in the past. There have been times where sea levels have risen and drowned a lot of the land. There have been times when sea levels have fallen. And there have been supercontinents where all the land was connected together. There have been times of enormous volcanic eruptions where there were grand canyon-sized holes in the earth that opened up and spewed out lava. There have been times of asteroids big asteroid impacts, all kinds of things have happened to the earth over time. And we can learn about them from the rocks and from the fossils. And it's this information that really puts into perspective our modern world. That's why we study paleontology. For me as a paleontologist, I want to know how the earth works, how the earth has changed over time, because that can help us understand our world today. And we know our world today is changing very fast. But the Earth has changed really fast before. There have been other times of climate change, other times of environmental change. We can go to the fossils and we can look at those fossils and they can help us understand what actually happens when temperatures rise, when sea levels rise. That to me is the power of paleontology and it makes it very relevant and very important. Uh, what it looks, uh, how the Earth looks four billion years ago. If we can go back four billion years ago, and this is an important time because it was probably roughly around then that the first living things evolved. So the Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago. Our oldest records of not quite fossils because the first living things were so tiny, it's hard to turn them into fossils, but there are chemical fingerprints that living things left behind. There are certain types of chemicals that you only see in plants and animals and other living things, and those can be preserved in the rocks, things like cholesterols and those kind of things. And so we can uh, see some of those, we can measure some of those in rocks that are about 4 billion years old. So more or less, we can say that the first living things probably evolved about 4 billion years ago. Those living things were minuscule. You would need a microscope to see them. They were essentially bacteria, single individual cells, tiny little things, very, very basic. But they could grow and they could reproduce and they metabolize. They took in energy uh, and they responded to the environment. They were alive. They had DNA and RNA. They were alive. They were ultimately very, very, very distant ancestors of ours. And the world they were living in was very different than the Earth of today. The atmosphere was very different. There was basically no oxygen in the atmosphere. If we went back to that time, if, if we were on some time machine and we were plopped back to four billion years ago, we would suffocate within a minute or two. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere, but it, the atmosphere was full of things like carbon dioxide and really nasty gases. Oxygen only came later, actually, as a byproduct as a waste product of some of those bacteria. It was living things that released oxygen as part of their growth, and that oxygen then went into the atmosphere. Wow. So that was one difference, and there were many others. The, the land would have looked different. The, the climate would have been different. There were still big, a lot more volcanic eruptions happening. There were a lot more asteroid and comet impacts. The Earth was being bombarded. Uh, for the first few hundred million years of the history of the Earth. Uh, early on, actually, the entire Earth, the whole surface was just an o ocean of molten lava <laughs> because all these asteroids were constantly hitting the Earth and all these volcanoes were erupting. And that was the sort of style, the sort of scene you can think of uh, when you think of the very, very, very oldest Earth. Uh, do we know what caused the living organism being in Earth? We do not know very much about the origin of life. It is still a big mystery. Uh, nobody, for instance, has ever been able to create life from non-life in the laboratory. And so because this happened about four billion years ago, we weren't around to see it. So we have to infer what happened from the clues that we have. And those clues are meager. What we do know is this that you can make the basic building blocks of life from non-living things. 
And you can do this yourself in an experiment. You can, you can get a bunch of water. You can put a bunch of elements in there, some sodium, some potassium, some calcium, some oxygen and hydrogen and, and so on. Shake it all up. You can spark it. You can take a, a lighter and give it a spark and, uh, and you can collect the products of that because that water will change a bit when you spark it. And when you do that, when you look at what's produced, you actually see the building blocks of DNA and RNA in there. You see those basic elements combine into things like nucleic acids. That's the technical term for the building blocks of DNA and RNA. And that means that you in the lab or even in your own home, you can create the building blocks of life from simple chemicals. Now the trick was somehow those building blocks of life had to combine into an organism that had structure, that had form, that could reproduce. Um, and that is where our knowledge remains quite limited. Now, I say this as a non-specialist. I study dinosaurs. I study mammals. I study things that came along much later, things that have bones and skeletons and teeth and hair. I am not an expert on the origin of life. I'm not an expert on bacteria. I'm sure there have been great advances in this field. Uh, that I don't know about. And I think it is a very exciting area of research. And actually, the people now who are studying the origin of life tend to be the same scientists who are studying whether there's life on other planets, the types of people that are using information from the Mars rovers to see if there were once living things on Mars, people trying to identify how we actually can find fossils or the signs of life in outer space. So this is a very interesting field of research. And it again shows how pay Paleontology can be relevant to bigger, broader uh, issues in science today. Okay. Can you explain me? So from the first organism, how did we evolve to have plants and trees and see? And like how does that process looked in the timeline of years? Yep. So I can give you a rundown of the history of life, a very quick rundown of the history of life. We're talking 4 billion years of evolution, okay? So I'll give it, do it in a minute or two. But basically, for the first few billion years, life was very boring. All living things were tiny, single-celled bacteria. You could not see them. You would need a microscope to see them. And then, somewhere probably around 2 billion years ago or so, some of those bacteria became able to grow bigger and to combine together so that you can have organisms made up of many individual cells. Now, meanwhile, some of these bacteria were also releasing oxygen as a byproduct of their growth. That oxygen went into the atmosphere, changed the atmosphere, and oxygen is really important for allowing bigger and more complex things to live. So it was probably that oxygen that helped some of those single little tiny cells combine into larger organisms with dozens of cells, hundreds of cells, eventually with trillions of cells like us. Now, somewhere around 600 million years ago or so, some of those more complex organisms became even bigger. Oh, and they became wow. mac what we call macroscopic. You could see them with your eyes if you were there then. They were things that you could hold in your hand. They were things that for, that had shells and skeletons and they had arms and legs and they started to move around and they could interact with their environment. These were the very first animals. And around the same time, probably some of the first plants were evolving. All this was happening in the oceans, though. And all throughout this time, all living things only lived in the water. There was nothing on the land. But then probably about, I don't know, somewhere around 500 million years ago, some of these living things ventured onto the land. And at first they were very simple, just little worms and that kind of stuff. Later on, plants came onto the land and plants established new ecosystems and forests developed. And those forests, um, they created entirely new ecological structures, new roles that, you know, leaves and stems and, and roots that, that organisms could eat. So plant eaters evolved and then meat eaters evolved to eat those plant eaters. So you had a whole uh, range a great increase in the complexity and the richness of life as life moved on to land. Meanwhile, life continued to evolve in, in the oceans. And this great diversity of things that we know 
of all of whether it be shellfish or, or or fish or whatever we have in the oceans today, these things developed over time too. And most of this has really only happened over the last few hundred million years, a tiny sliver of Earth history. Now, about 230 million years ago, the very first dinosaurs evolved and the very first mammals evolved. And those mammals were our ancestors. So, so in 300 million years from 600 million years mm -hmm. from something small, plants, something small that starts yeah. to dinosaurs. So basically, it, it, yes, it took it a few really, hundred million years, but it, wow. and that's pretty fast wow. because the wow. earth is so old. And yes. so that shows things have sped up over time for so long. Life was boring. It was fairly simple. And then more recently, things have accelerated and you have this great diversification of bigger, more complex, more interesting living things, things that interact with each other, that form ecosystems and things that eat different types of food and can move around in different ways. And that has led to, to our world today. So that's the very brief kind of a few minute version of the history of life. But the, the main thing is that life is really old. It goes back probably about 4 billion years. For most of Earth history, life was simple. It's only been quite recently that larger things have evolved, that things have started living on land, and things like dinosaurs and woolly mammoths and humans, really all of these things, these fossils that we're so familiar with, they are quite recent compared to the great history of the Earth. Wow, I can't believe this. This is so beautiful that everything evolved in the last 500 million years and the earth is like 600 million years and the earth is 4 billion years. That tells us a lot about st the n stars and space exploration and all this stuff. A lot of things can evolve, but they need the time. Absolutely. And we are one planet in a solar system where there's seven or eight other planets, depending on <laughs> what you think of Pluto. Uh, and that solar system we're in is in a galaxy, and that's one of many galaxies, probably countless galaxies in the universe. Uh, and so if you think about it, the odds are that there's probably some other living things out there somewhere. They might not look like us. They may not be speaking to each other. They might not have the same level of intelligence. Who knows, really? But the odds are the universe is so vast that there's something else out there. And so the trick then is, how do we figure that out? How can we actually find fossils in outer space? Or how could we make contact with another uh life form out there somewhere. If it's a civilization out there somewhere, that's one thing. And maybe there's ways that we could communicate with them through, uh, you know, radio waves or through other types of, of interstellar communication. Uh, but if you got some, some type of bacteria out there that's living on a planet that's, you know, millions of, of, of light years away, how could you possibly identify that? How would you know? It's such a mystery. So I think we, we have to keep an open mind. I think it's a fun thing to think about. And I am hopeful that, you know, someday some piece of asteroid will fall to the Earth that was once part of some distant planet. And there'll be a fossil in there, some little bacteria that was once alive. I'm hopeful. And that would be such an amazing, groundbreaking scientific discovery if it ever happens. But more likely than that is that somebody exploring Mars finds something because Mars is a close planet to us. It is, it is uh, a very near neighbor of ours. It is roughly similar in size to the Earth. There were periods of time when Mars had running water. And so maybe just maybe there were once living things on Mars. Maybe astronauts can go to Mars one day and, and find those fossils. Maybe there'll be a paleontologist astronaut that goes to Mars with, with their hammer, with their chisel, goes out, looks at the rocks and actually finds fossils. And I think that would just be remarkable. Imagine if they were humans, but maybe in different time. Wow. Yep. It's, it's, this is mind boggling stuff, but you know, to me, this is science. This is fun. You know, we want to understand our world. We want to understand our universe. Uh, we want to use all the tools that we can and we want to keep an open mind. We want to keep our imagination. I think one of the things that maybe doesn't always come across, uh, in science is that scientists, you know, we, we good science is creative. I think there's a, there's a tendency to consider scientists to be the, these robots, essentially, people that just memorize a lot of facts and figures and numbers and people that sit at their computers all day, hyper rational. Uh, but no, you know, good science is creative. Good science, you have to think 
Where are the boundaries? Where are the this mysteries? is what Where are school the- this is what school make us think. This, exactly, <laughs> you're right. I mean, for me, when I was young, science was my least favorite class in school, and that's no fault of any of my teachers. I don't blame anybody, but you know, it just isn't presented in a very exciting way like some other subjects are and really science is about asking questions and looking for answers and keeping an open mind and that is what i love about being a scientist because every day i have the potential to learn something new something new about the world that nobody knew before and that's really cool that is just really really neat uh and i get to be creative i get to to think of things, think of mysteries, and go out and try to solve them. And and to me, there's no better life than that. Yes. It's crazy that I, school, I was I was the worst student, head in history, head in uh, ev- uh, science, head in everything. And now I'm actually in love with all these t- topics. So, that's great. So and that's, that's so common. I, I, this is true for me. I became interested in science when I was a teenager. I was still in school, but I was getting older and I was able to read and uh, make connections in ways that, that I couldn't when I was younger. But I hear this all the time, you know, people uh, that in when they're adults, they become interested in science. Either it's rekindled, maybe as a kid, they were into dinosaurs, into volcanoes, into outer space and astronauts and stuff, or they never were because they never got the opportunity. But as an adult, when you get that chance to uh, do your own thing and you start reading about science, learning about science, uh, there's so many resources online, of course, that that have helped inspire people. Um, It just goes to show that it's never too late. And the thing I'll say about paleontology is that, you know, I'm speaking here as an academic paleontologist. I teach at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm a researcher. Um, I'm very much in that ivory tower of the academic world. But most fossils are not found by the professors, okay? Of so many fossils are found by construction workers. They're found by hikers. They're found by farmers. Sometimes fossils are even found by kids that are out walking with their parents. You don't need an advanced degree to find a fossil. You don't need to be a professor or a PhD to find a fossil. Anybody can find a fossil. So that makes paleontology, I think, one of the most accessible sciences out there. It's really a populist science and anybody can make a contribution. And I know people that in their retirement, they became fossil collectors and they started finding amazing fossils. There are new species that had never been seen before. And that really shows it's never too late if you're interested in paleontology to become enthused about it, to become part of the community and to make a real scientific contribution. So I see that you are uh, very passionate in a way of bringing people in interested in the topic. Is that that you are actively doing you personally? I love this line of work. And I love the fact that I found something that I'm passionate about when I was a teenager and I was able to make it into a career. Fossils, dinosaurs, evolution, the history of life. Uh, And so I think it comes across with my uh, excitement whenever I talk about it, like right now. Uh, And I just love it. Uh, And I think um, it's something that I try to evangelize to others. So I am always trying to write about fossils, speak about fossils. I'm trying to communicate with people, not just people in the academic world, but this is why I write books, popular science books. Those books are not for other academics. They're not for even for students of paleontology. They're for just regular people from all walks of life. And I write books for kids as well. I do a lot of talks. I do a lot of lectures. I do a lot of consultancy on films. I was the uh, paleontology advisor on the most recent Jurassic World film, Jurassic World Dominion that came out last summer. Uh, I've done a lot of work with television and radio and video games and all sorts of different media. I just love to find new ways to communicate science to audiences broadly. I think that is as important as my academic work. And I'm probably better at that, frankly, than I am at science. You know, I think I'm an okay scientist. I'm probably better uh, talking about science. And I uh, feel very privileged that I get to do this uh, for my job. I And, and I love it. I want to keep going. Um, I've you know, started writing a book on birds now. That'll be the next one, The Evolution of Birds. I was actually doing a bit of research on that right before our call. Uh, it'll be a few years before that's finished, but I'm starting to get deeper 
into that. And I really uh, just love it. And I think there's something special about paleontology. There's something magical about fossils, about being able to go out and to find these shells or bones or teeth, these things that are millions, even billions of years old. When you find them, you're the first person to ever see this fossil when you pluck it out of the rocks. And it's a connection to a world that doesn't exist anymore. It's a connection to the very, very deep past of the earth. There is something so magical about that. And I love to, to use that magic to try to reach people and connect with people. I see it in real time and I can't believe how good of a communicator you are. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Well, <laughs> I, 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 studying dinosaurs and, and other types of fossils, these things are interesting. People love them, right? I mean, we all go to the museum, we see a skeleton, a T-Rex, we stand under it, we gawk at how big it was and how scary it was. There's just a, an immediate connection. I think it would be more challenging to uh, communicate particle physics <laughs> or organic <laughs> chemistry or something like that. Um, but by and large, uh, what I want to get across to people is that science is cool, science is fun, science is important. And things like dinosaurs and fossils, I think, are important for two reasons. First of all, so many people become interested in science when they're young, mostly because of dinosaurs and fossils. That is the gateway into science. And most of those people won't go on to become paleontologists, but maybe they'll become doctors, engineers, the sort of people that develop new drugs and new treatments, the sort of per the person that cures cancer one day very well could have gotten into science because of a love of T-Rex at age five. So I think that's important. But the second reason paleontology is important, just circling back to one of the things we discussed earlier, is that fossils are the clues that tell us how the earth works and how the earth has changed over time and how organisms have responded to climate change and environmental change. Everything that's happening on the earth now, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, extinctions, so on, this has all happened before for different reasons. The causes are often different, but these things have happened before. So if we want to learn, we got to look at the fossils. Can you give me a... Uh... I want to get also in uh, in the rising uh, temperatures and all this stuff and what do, can we learn uh, from that to apply to the problem that we have now in our age. But can you give me what are the major events that happen in the history of the world in a big scale, like maybe an asteroid came, yes. maybe... <laughs> maybe the sex of Ad for Adam and Eve or something. <laughs> so let me so so I'll go through I'll go through uh, the timeline of what I think are the big events. So four and a half billion years ago, the Earth forms out of this cloud of dust and gas as the our solar system is forming. Then about four billion years ago, the first little bacteria evolved, and as I mentioned earlier, for billions of years, those bacteria were tiny, they were simple, they weren't very impressive, but they were releasing oxygen, some of them. And that oxygen built up in the atmosphere, it changed the atmosphere, and it made it so that bigger organisms, more complex organisms, ones with skeletons, ones with arms and legs and brains and hearts could evolve. And then about 600 million years ago, give or take, the first animals evolved. And then a little bit after that, animals started to diversify like crazy. And this was all in the oceans. That's when things started getting interesting. So about, let's start about 500 million years ago now. You have all these living things in the oceans, nothing really on land yet. Some of the first things are starting to move on to land. But you have different types of fish and you have different types of corals and jellyfish and shellfish and all these kinds of things living uh, in the oceans. Then some of those things venture onto land. And probably about uh, 390 million years ago, give or take, some fishes changed their fins into arms and legs. And they hoisted themselves up onto the land. And they were our ultimate ancestors. Around the same time, plants, of course, were colonizing the land. And that led to huge changes around the earth. And there was actually a couple of big extinctions that happened. One was an ice age and one was a time probably of cooling temperatures that had to do with plants evolving and plants growing and plants taking so much carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere 
that the Earth got colder. This was all happening between about 400 million and 300 million years ago. The Earth adapted. The Earth changed. New living things evolved. And by about 250 million years ago, you had thriving ecosystems on land and in the ocean. And then 250 million years ago, these enormous volcanoes started to erupt, and they started to erupt in what's now Russia. And these volcanoes were unlike anything humans have ever seen, thank God, because these were apocalyptic volcanoes. This was not like Mount St. Helens or Mount Pinatubo having an eruption and then going dormant. This wasn't like the Hawaiian volcanoes just, you know, releasing a little bit of lava. These were mega volcanoes, and these were essentially holes in the earth, wounds in the earth, the size of the Grand Canyon, even bigger, that opened up and they spilled out tsunamis of lava for hundreds of thousands of years. And that lava covered an area of land greater than all of Western Europe put together. So imagine that, a volcano so big that it covers all of Europe in lava. So anything living in the vicinity of these volcanoes died. But, but the problem was even worse because as that lava came up through the earth, it burnt through the earth. And as it burnt through the earth, it released pollution. It released carbon dioxide and methane and these nasty gases, some of which are greenhouse gases, and they warmed the atmosphere and they led to global warming. And that caused a huge extinction. And maybe 95% of all species died out about 250 million years ago. And this is what's called the end Permian mass extinction. The Permian was the period of time at that point when the volcanoes were erupting. And this was the closest life has ever come to completely dying out ever since those first little bacteria evolved 4 billion years ago. But 5% of living things did survive somehow through skill or through luck or through both. And some of those survivors were the immediate ancestors of dinosaurs and mammals. We had ancestors that survived those volcanoes. And then in the aftermath, the next period of time, the Triassic period, that's when dinosaurs and mammals started to diversify and spread around the world. And they wouldn't become very big or very dominant that quickly. It took another extinction about 200 million years ago. More big volcanoes erupted. There was more global warming. There was another mass extinction that wiped away a lot of the other animals at the time, but spared the dinosaurs and the mammals. Then afterwards, in the next period of time, which is the Jurassic period, that's when dinosaurs grew to huge sizes. Some of them became bigger than jet airplanes. And you had meat-eating dinosaurs the size of buses and all these fantastic dinosaurs with spikes and frills and horns and duckbills and beaks and dome heads and long necks and all the crazy things we think of of dinosaurs. This is in the Jurassic period when all these dinosaurs are diversifying. Meanwhile, the mammals stay small. They're living in the shadows. The dinosaurs are getting so big that mammals have to eke out an existence at night, underground, in the undergrowth. But they became very good, these mammals, at living anonymously. They became really smart. They evolved keen senses. They started, they evolved ways to grow really fast and to adapt to those dangerous environments. And then 66 million years ago, literally one day, this asteroid falls out of the sky. It's a rock that was about 10 kilometers wide or about six miles wide. So basically a rock the size of Mount Everest. And it was hurtling through outer space like 10 times faster or more than a speeding bullet. And it could have gone anywhere, right? It's a piece of space junk. It could have gone anywhere. But it just so happened to make a direct impact with the Earth. And it smashed into what is now Mexico. And it released more than one billion nuclear bombs worth of energy. And it punched a hole in the Earth over 150 one kilometers. One billion wide. nuclear yeah, So imagine one bombs. billion nuclear bombs put together, put into some pile, and detonated. And that's the amount of energy released. Now, this was no normal day. This was the biggest asteroid that's hit the Earth in at least the last half a billion years. But it was apocalyptic. And the moment the asteroid hit, dinosaurs were thriving. T-Rex was there. Triceratops, the one with three horns on its head, was there. Countless other dinosaurs were there. They were ruling the world. They were living all over the world. They were very diverse. 
But that asteroid unleashed chaos. It caused tsunamis and earthquakes and fires and all the dust and dirt and grime from the collision went into the atmosphere, spread around the world. It blocked out the sun for probably at least a few years, maybe even a decade. So imagine a global winter, cold, dark, that lasted several years. There was no sunlight. Plants could not get the sunlight they needed to make their own food. So they died. The forest collapsed. The plant-eating animals, they didn't have any food to eat. They died. Then the meat eaters didn't have any food to eat. They died. So ecosystems, they just imploded like a house of cards collapsing. And 75% of all species died. Three out of every four things died. If you were alive then, you think about it. There's a gun. There's four chambers. There's three bullets. That's your chance of survival. But some things did survive. One peculiar type of dinosaur survived. All the other ones died. The T-Rexes, the ones with the long necks, the ones with horns. All those famous dinosaurs died. But one really quirky, weird type of tiny dinosaur lived on. And these were the dinosaurs that had wings and feathers and beaks. They were this weird group of dinosaurs that developed the ability to fly. And they're birds. So today's birds evolved from dinosaurs. They were the only dinosaurs to survive the asteroid. The other thing that survived were some of our tiny, furry, little mammal ancestors because they had to live so long in the shadow of the dinosaurs. They became so adaptable, so resilient, so good at living in the oh darkness. My God. The I just air. love every second of you speaking. <laughs> this is beautiful. Continue, continue. Just wanted to point that out that this is so amazing. <laughs> well, it's a great story and this has all happened you know i'm not a fiction writer here i'm not creating a story this is the it real seems story like life. it it and seems it like does, it doesn't it but you know what we have fossils that tell the story and it's amazing and so you know we had we had ancestors right we had ancestors that survived all of these apocalypses otherwise we wouldn't be here that shows the improbability of us having this conversation. But we had an ancestor that stared down that asteroid that survived the hellscape when T-Rex and Triceratops died. And imagine that you were this tiny little mouse thing, basically, a little mammal, furry little thing, smart, intelligent, good senses, uh, and you survive that asteroid. And you come out of your burrow and you see that it's dark. And you live underground for a while. You come out again and you see the sunlight starting to peek through. And you look out at destruction everywhere. And suddenly there's no T-Rexes anymore. There's no dinosaurs anymore, except for a few of those strange birds flying around. It was a whole new world, a world of abundant opportunity, a new frontier. And these little mammals, they took advantage. And within a very short amount of time, within a few hundred thousand years at most, these mammals started to get bigger. And we have fossils. We look for fossils of these mammals in New Mexico, the mammals that lived right after the asteroid killed the dinosaurs. And within 200,000 years, you have mammals the size of pigs. Now, for 150 million years before, a mammal never got bigger than a house cat. Now the dinosaurs are dead within a few hundred thousand years, mammals the size of pigs. Within a million years, mammals the size of cows. Within thank, a million years, thank God the dinosaurs yeah. didn't survive. Exactly. We would not be here. We would, <laughs> our mammal family would still be these tiny little things scurrying around trying to avoid the footsteps of dinosaurs, if it wasn't for that asteroid. So that also just goes to show how connected this all is. When we study dinosaurs, this isn't just some frivolous game that we're playing. This is information that tells us about our history. The history of humanity, it wouldn't have unfolded if the dinosaurs were not wiped out by that asteroid. All of this stuff is connected. Evolution, Earth history is all connected in one big story. And so the story of the dinosaurs really is our story, too. And that's another reason why it's important to study not only dinosaurs, but other fossils, because these are not irrelevant things. These are living things. They are part of the same family of life that we are. And their fates and their changes over time are directly linked to our fate. So 65 million years ago, we have pigs. After that, the monkeys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so very quickly after the asteroid, within a few hundred thousand years, there's these little fossil teeth that start to show up. And 
they can be found in a lot of places, but a lot of the best ones are found in places like Montana and the Dakotas, the states in, in, in the American Plains, kind of the, 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 the central part of, of America, slightly to the west in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains. And these little fossils, uh, they're tiny, you know, they're tiny little teeth. And we can tell from the shapes of those teeth that they are the teeth of primates. They look pretty similar to the teeth of a lot of monkeys and other primates today. And so that means that the first primates only got their opportunity because the dinosaurs died. The first primates started to live and started to evolve and started to change and spread around the world soon after the dinosaurs died. And these primates were our ancestors. And they were one of many groups of mammals that were getting their start that were staking their own claim, that were spreading around the world and growing and diversifying after the asteroid. This is when we start to see the first members of the groups that would become horses and cattle, rodents, elephants, even whales and bats, these most peculiar of mammals, ones that have completely changed their bodies so that they can swim in the water or fly through the air. We start to see them show up in the fossil record. All of these new mammals are there only because the dinosaurs had the courtesy to die out when that asteroid hit. And so the last 65, 66 million years has been a story of mammals, not only mammals. Other things survived the asteroid too, including birds, but also crocodiles and frogs and lizards and all kinds of animals in the ocean, not to mention plants and bacteria. Lots of things did survive. Uh, but the last 65 or 66 million years, really the, the world has become the age of mammals, and we are part of that. And the very first primates I mentioned lived right after the dinosaurs died. The very first things that we can call humans, apes that walked on their hind legs, that could walk upright and started to use tools and started to evolve bigger brains. Basically, our lineage that split off from the chimpanzees, that happened probably between six and eight million years ago, maybe, and it happened in Africa. And we can tell that because we have fossils of, some, of a lot of those first early humans from Africa. Some of them started to make forays into Europe and into Asia and beyond. Most of those waves of migration didn't get that very far. But then about 200 to 300,000 years ago, this new type of human evolved in Africa, a new species, Homo sapiens, with a bigger brain, with wanderlust and the ability to move around the world. And our own species is the one that has been able to colonize the entire world, that spread to every continent, even now, to outer space. And that is the story of life right there in brief, of course, is much richer than that. Uh, when I write these books, I try to tell the, 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 the more complete story. There's so many plots and subplots and interesting characters. There are so many incredible extinct species that once lived that now we only know from fossils. And we really are just starting to learn. People are finding more fossils than, other, than ever before. There are about 50 new species of dinosaurs that are found every single year. So once a week, somebody's finding a totally new dinosaur on average just because there's more people looking, more people looking around the world. And we need this to continue because this is how we will continue to flesh out that story of the history of life and the history of Earth. While you were talking, I had an epiphany. I was like, oh, maybe the aliens... Uh, that we are going to find because they didn't have an asteroid hitting them. There would be maybe huge dinosaurs or huge Who knows, giants. Right? Who knows? Because it's like our own lives, all of our individual wow. human lives. We can say if we didn't, you know, go to this school, if we didn't go to that bar at that time and meet that, that woman, you know, that became my wife, we wouldn't have these kids. You know, we all have our own stories of contingency and there's, an infinite number of other lives we could have if one little thing turned out differently. The universe is surely the same. And if there are living things on other planets, they would have experienced different things than living things here on Earth. So the stories out there are vast. And I hope that we can just find those clues in outer space about so what it's, else might it, be out there. It's unlimited to what can the aliens can be in a way of form. Maybe they are just wavelengths. So I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. There is so much more to find. And I think that's a, a great 
thing to end on here. You know, science is, is not a collection of facts and figures and numbers. It's not stuff you memorize in school. It's not just memorizing the periodic table of the elements uh, or the structure of the atom. Science is a process of discovery. And the more we learn, the more we learn about stuff we don't know, <laughs> the more mysteries emerge. And so science very much is a game of adventure and discovery. It's a game of mystery solving. And that's what makes it really fun to be a scientist. So, so we need to do this again sometime in the future to answer the question about artificial intelligence and the future of paleontology. Yes. yes. So, uh, but <laughs> in the further future. Uh, so I just want to mention that, oh my God, this, this, I expect, I saw that you are a good communicator, but this <laughs> exceeded beyond well, any expectation that I had. This was the, the best date that I could ever go, even with the most <laughs> beautiful women in the world. So and I, I'm sure the audience felt the same thing. So well, thank, thank you for your thank time. You. It was great to chat. And yeah, let's chat again down the line. We can talk about birds when I finish that book. Okay. So we'll make yes, a point of view. I'm excited. So. Okay. Very I good. love you. Thank you so much Thanks for watching, yep. guys.